So we're just getting ready to get going on the construction project here that we started last spring. This is our corral system. It's going to house pigs, chickens, ducks, geese, probably a couple dairy cows, maybe some dairy goats, and maybe, maybe some sheep. So we're gonna try and have a really diverse flock slash herd of animals that mob around the property and are able to take advantage of the massive diversity of plants that we have on our farm. So we've got forests, we've got pastures, we've got wetlands, we've got um, everything in between. Even, even our gardens and our food forests and our orchards are all going to be different niches that exist on this property when we're done that these livestock are basically going to go off as autonomous conscious beings that will be able to collect the solar energy that this property collects that we can meet our daily and yearly needs of food, fiber, um, and all of the other products, labor that uh, livestock kind of bring along with them. I want to show you how we're building it because I think it's pretty cool and I'm going to take you around here. It's tough with the snow to kind of see any contrast right now so you're probably not going to really understand everything that I'm talking about but don't worry I'll make another video in the spring as we get into constructing it so you'll be able to see it come together piece by piece. But before I show you I wanted to talk about a couple of things that I find really interesting. So the first thing is I want to talk about the current narrative around why humans need to go to this 100% vegan or vegetarian diet. Where that comes from and or where I think it probably comes from and uh, why I think it's maladaptive at least for the northern hemisphere of the climate. And then number two I want to talk about not only why I think it's maladaptive but I want to talk about how ecosystems function and how we can learn from our ecosystems in order to design better systems that basically negate this idea that we're going to have to eat only vegetables or vegetarian or even a bug-based diet sometime in the future. So let's get into it. In my opinion, the people that are making decisions in our society right now, whether these are the politicians, the heads of corporations, uh, policy makers, um, you name it, scientists, I believe that this narrative around veganism and vegetarianism is the result of some of these people coming to the conclusion that we have overshot Earth's carrying capacity. Now in a large part, I actually think that these policy makers and scientists are probably right. I think we probably have overshot our holding capacity on planet Earth. And it's easy for me in Canada to say that or even to count that argument when I live on 160 acres of land in a country that's sparsely populated with the most water, the most soil, the most forest, the most oil, or maybe maybe not quite the most oil, but it's right up there uh, globally. But the reality is, is that Canadians don't really have a good understanding of the scale of population that exists in places like India and China um, and various other places of the world. Now the caveat that I'll put on that is that while we may have uh, reached a limit or overshot a limit, the way I would frame it is that we have overshot the carrying capacity of Earth given the current paradigm that we operate under, which is what I would refer to as the industrial paradigm. And this paradigm has us using massive amounts of fossil fuel and mining all sorts of resources out of the planet at rates that just cannot be replenished in a human lifetime or in even many, many human lifetimes or generations. And so I would agree with them that we have overshot the industrial carrying capacity of Earth. To put this in perspective, I recently listened to a podcast where a, an astrophysicist was basically projecting out what a 3% growth rate on planet Earth would look like uh, over the next 400 and 1200 years. And if we continue to grow the way that we're growing right now at 3% per year, and this is the GDP that I'm referring to, we will need a Dyson sphere around the sun, which means essentially a structure that we've never, we don't know if it exists or if it's even possible to build, but essentially a Dyson sphere is a structure that you place around the sun that captures most of its energy, and then somehow it wirelessly sends that energy to planet Earth. And then he went on further and said, if you continue to grow at 3% from that point, once you'd had that Dyson sphere, 
within 1200 years you need all the power of the universe. And so you start to see how ridiculous this concept of perpetual growth actually is. In another podcast that I listened to over the holidays, for the first time in my life, I actually heard a scientist talking about the concept of a giga famine. And so this is a famine where a billion plus people are starving around the world. Now, if you've read anything about the Irish potato famine, you'll know that that was pretty grim. 25% of the people living in Ireland died and 25%, another 25% of them actually left the island to go to other places. Unfortunately, there's nowhere else to go. We've run out of agricultural land, at least industrial agricultural land. Um, you know, there are attempts to try and colonize Mars, which I think are maladaptive. I understand the reasons behind it, but I don't think it's going to work. And so we need to find a different way of coexisting on this planet. So with that in mind, if you are a policymaker, a scientist, or a politician, or a corporation, or a billionaire, and you were starting to understand some of these limitations that I've just talked about, because maybe you have access to data that the rest of us people don't have, then you would probably start clawing for information to try and understand what to do about this giant Gordian knot. And one place that would make sense to look for that information would be the classic trophic pyramid that we all studied in grade 10 biology. And the trophic pyramid is, is a pretty valuable tool. It's interesting because it, it really allows us to look at ecology through a lens with which most of us can understand, which is a reductionist lens. And it breaks ecosystems down into very simple energy flows. And so sun comes into the planet, it allows plants to photosynthesize, plants produce biomass, that biomass is then consumed by primary consumers, which are things like herbivores, so cows, rabbits, um, geese, sheep, uh, even goats, and then all the wild counterparts as well. And these animals are specialized in turning cellulose and plant material into fat, protein. So from the primary consumer's perspective, it'll move up to the omnivores, which are going to be things like pigs, chickens, and ducks, and then the wild counterparts, which could be bears, wild fowl, and other omnivores, which are going to eat a combination of plants as well as animals. And so every time we move one level up this trophic pyramid, there's a 10x reduction in biomass. So there's 10 times more plant biomass than there is primary producers or herbivore biomass. And there's 10 times more herbivore biomass than there is omnivore biomass, and so on and so forth until you get to the obligate carnivores all the way up. And so if you're a policymaker and you're saying, well, there isn't enough plant material to be consumed on Earth. So if you're a policymaker and you're seeing the limits to growth that, that are coming up ahead, and you're saying there is not enough uh, biomass in the mammalian species that we consume, or even the fowl, so the pigs, the chickens, and the beef, um, then you would, you know, come to a hope, then a simpleton solution to that very complex answer would be, well, we have to force all of the humans to eat plant-based diets because there's 10 times more plants than there are uh, the, the, the herbivore layer. And in some ways you're right, but in a lot of ways you're wrong because when we actually break the system down into these simplistic systems and components, we miss the whole. And we make big mistakes when we miss that whole. William Reese, an evolutionary ecologist from the University of British Columbia, recently stated that 96% of the biomass on Earth is humans and their livestock. And about 4% of it is uh, wild biomass, essentially. And so basically we've consumed the majority of the primary production of planet Earth. Now, if we think about this vegetarian and vegan argument, um, then all of a sudden all the trees that are behind me, any vegetation that essentially humans can't eat, become a threat to human survival if we're going to coexist entirely on a plant-based diet. So keep in mind that living on a plant-based diet means we're eating things like soy, canola, wheat, um, especially in the northern hemispheres if we're eating local, uh, possibly some corn, um, you know, and then the vegetables that come out of our gardens or out of large-scale industrial uh, garden farms. 
Um, and so whenever you've got vegetation like that that's growing and you've got a paradigm where everything that we do has to be consuming vegetables, then every other species on earth that is not food that humans can eat becomes a uh, a blockade, a problem, something that has to be er eradicated. And so then you end up with industrial vegetable farms, industrial plant-based farms that uh, eradicate the animals that used to live there. And they don't just eradicate the livestock that used to live there, they, they eradicate all of the other species, the birds that you can hear in the background of my farm, the other, the wild mammals, the wild fowl that live on these properties in these forests. And so a vegetarian or vegan diet doesn't actually solve the problem. In fact, it makes it worse. And so now we're not just going to consume all of the capacity of uh, the mammalian biomass, but we're also going to consume all of the plant biomass on planet Earth. And so it's just the same problem that we currently have with our industrial meat system transmutated onto our industrial plant-based system. And that's just not going to work. Now, I'm not saying that I'm against a vegan or vegetarian diet. I think everybody should be able to eat whatever it is that they want to eat. And in fact, an uh, interview with Will Harris and Joe Rogan, uh, Will Harris, who is a regenerative protein farmer, he, he farms pigs and poultry and, and cattle, said that he would die for the right for vegans and vegetarians to be able to choose what they want to eat. But he said that if I'm going to give them my life or fight for their right to eat whatever it is that they want, then I should also have the right to eat what I want to eat as well. And again, this comes back down to our basic democratic rights in living in a free society. What I am saying is that I believe that the most adaptive, resilient, and regenerative diet that we can consume is actually an omnivorous one. And here's why. Right now, omnivores in the Western world subside on mostly confined animal feeding operation meat and industrial farmed vegetables and plant foods. This is not sustainable, it's not regenerative, and it's coming to an end because of peak phosphorus, peak oil, peak everything. We don't need to go through the list again. However, when we look at the principles of regenerating ecosystems, one of them is that we want a diversity of plants and we want a diversity of animals, wild and domesticated. We don't just want one type of animal. And an omnivorous diet allows us to be able to capture the energy off of these systems, the surplus off of these systems, as it becomes available. So in order to be able to have a regenerative culture, and one that is gonna persist for many decades into the future, generations into the future, we need to have a regenerative diet, which means that our diet needs to consist of a diverse number of feedstuffs coming into it. And in order for this to become a reality, we actually have to look at the trophic pyramid through a slightly different lens. And that means that while the trophic pyramid appears fairly linear, everything seems to move up. Sun comes in, plants grow, plants go up to herbivores, herbivores go up to omnivores, omnivores go up to carnivores. We have to remember that there are cycles that occur within that as well. And so it's much more effective to think about our trophic pyramid as a web of life. And so this is exactly what is going on in this corral system right now. Behind me is that barn and I'm standing right in the middle of what the future corral is going to be. And so within here we're going to have herbivores and omnivores and then I'm going to be the carnivore, at least the omnivore that's living in that house consuming whatever surplus comes off of this system. And so we're going to have a combination of um, sheep, goats, cows, and geese. Those are the herbivore layer. And in an ideal world, we'll have 10 times the biomass of those animals that we will the omnivores that sit right above it, which are going to be things like chickens and pigs. And so we're not going to build a system out of chickens and pigs that require grain coming in from outside of the farm because grain is basically just oil that's being transmuted in a very inefficient way to feed animals that require um, outside protein and fats coming in in the form of grains and other feed things. So to have a resilient food system, you actually have to understand how to capture that solar energy. And by depending upon grain from other farms or other feed inputs, feeds from feed stores, all we're doing is we're spreading out the footprint that we required in order to operate this farm to many, many other farms. Now we have 160 acres here of trees and pasture and wetlands, all of which produce plant material that can be put to productive use 
if it's effectively managed. But we need to have the right herbivores to be able to go out into those systems and collect those resources that I can't eat. I can't eat pine needles and I can't eat aspen bark and I can't eat aspen leaves. Um, at least not get any kind of meaningful nutrition out of it. But my sheep and my goats can eat that. I can't eat the grasses that grow here, but my geese and my cows will. And they'll come back into this system in the evenings and they're gonna defecate into this area here. And this area is gonna be filled up with wood mulch. The wood mulch is gonna mix with that manure and bugs are gonna come and nest inside of that manure. The chickens are then gonna come along and they're gonna consume those bugs. We may have to feed those chickens some of the compost coming off of, our, uh, off of our house, same with some of those pigs. But the idea here is that we're not having to bring massive amounts of food into the system. The food is actually grown as a result of the solar photosynthesis that occurs on this piece of earth um, that we collect here. And then from here, the manures and the compost that come out of this system are gonna get pushed back up the hill to where we grow all of our vegetables. Those vegetables then go to feed us. Whatever we don't consume out of the vegetables come back. And so everything that we do cycles. But the number one thing that I see most farms, most homesteads getting wrong is that they think to, that to homestead, they have to basically build a system, fill it with chickens and pigs, and then bring feed in from the outside. But all you're doing is basically creating dependency on other farms that are highly dependent upon fossil fuels and fertilizers in order to produce those grains so that you can grow out these animals uh, with feed that comes from faraway places. In order to prevent this giga famine that people are starting to talk about now, there's three things we have to do. Number one, and nobody's going to want to hear this, but we have to limit our population on earth. We can't perpetually grow. We are running out of stuff to keep all of these humans alive. Jared Diamond in his book Collapse talks a lot about the different indigenous groups around the world that had to come to those conclusions in a really hard way. And they had all sorts of different methods of controlling population. We have even more methods now than we ever have. And it's not that we shouldn't have children. I think it's important that we continue the human experiment, but we need to be intelligent about how many children we bring into the earth. And that's not gonna be a popular message for people, some people to receive. Number two, we have got to regenerate the land that has been desertified over the last 10,000 years. Humans have been deforesting, plowing, and desertifying land for 10,000 years in this experiment called agriculture, and it has to stop. We've run out of soil. In fact, some scientists are saying we have 60 cycles, 60 crop cycles left on planet Earth. Um, there's just nowhere else to go. And so even if we move to a vegetable-based diet, um, we're going to end up doing more destruction to the earth than we are going to save it. And so we have to regenerate the deserts that we've created. We have to do it in a way that uh, facilitates the most effective uh, adaptive diet for that particular region. And so if you're, for example, really committed to the vegan or vegetarian lifestyle and you want to be regenerative, then the perfect place on earth for you to live is in the tropics or the subtropics where that kind of a diet can actually be sustained. If you're planning on living in the northern hemisphere and you want to live a regenerative life, then you need to consider being an omnivore because that is the most adaptive and regenerative lifestyle that you can live here. And to be honest, if you're concerned about peak food and peak soil and peak oil and all these other things we keep talking about, then living a vegetarian diet up here is a recipe for starvation because some seasons you get great outputs of the garden and some seasons you don't. And so you wanna have a diversity of places where your energy can come from so that you have a high chance of being able to adapt to whatever climatic things get thrown at you. And so to build on point two, that we have to regenerate these lands, we have to do it in a way that understands how trophic pyramids and even trophic webs function which means that we can't just continue to transport the same old homesteading habits or farming habits to every place we go on earth. We have to go back to building mixed farms that understand how ecosystems function, understand how photosynthesis works, understand why biodiversity is important, and how to best capture that biodiversity in ways that don't eliminate the ability for other species around us to coexist. We need this ecosystem in order to continue to operate on this planet. And if we continue to mineralize it and turn it into um, 
very simple ecosystems like wheat fields or fields of carrots um, or even confined animal feeding operations for that matter, we won't be on this planet for much longer. Understanding the complexities and the dynamics and the nuances of the trophic pyramid or trophic web means that when we're setting up our systems, we have to be able to do an inventory of the plants that are growing around us. So in order to get this right and to mimic nature when we're designing our farm or our homestead, we want to make sure we have 10 times the plant biomass that we do have the herbivore biomass. And then going up the trophic pyramid, we want to make sure we have 10 times the herbivore biomass that we do have the omnivore bi biomass. And so the way that this could look is you could look at the amount of hay that your, your farm produces or the amount of biomass and the trees that it produces. And let's say it produces 100 tons per year on your piece of land. That means it can sustain approximately 10 tons of herbivores. And then if you know that you can have 10 tons of herbivores, then that means you could theoretically sustain uh, one ton of omnivores in biomass. Um, and so you can look at what herbivores, omnivores, and even plant species are available in your ecosystem. And then from there you can start to design something like we've got here. And so we've got gardens and orchards and food forests, plus all of the deciduous and coniferous forest, all the grasslands that we've got here. And so we can make an estimation with regards to how much biomass those systems produce. And then from there we can figure out how many goats, sheep, cows, and geese this farm can sustain. And then from there we can use a 10x reduction to figure out how many chickens and pigs we can produce. And that will give us some approximate numbers with regards to what a stable ecosystem would actually look like for this piece of land. And in a, if we get it right, which we're, we're probably not going to get it right the first time and we're going to have to tweak it as we go along, we should be able to build a system without having to import massive amounts of grain or basically fossil fuel. And the reason I keep calling grain fossil fuel is that every calorie of food that we produce in the current industrial paradigm takes 20 calories of hydrocarbon to produce it. So we're actually not feeding our pigs and chickens grain, we're feeding them oil. Now once we have these animals and these plant systems, we're going to end up having their wastes as well. And so we have to find effective ways to utilize their waste. Now when we look at a confined animal feeding operation, chicken barn or a feedlot, the waste is the biggest problem that these systems have. They've got so many animals in one place for way too long, which creates these massive, massive problems with their manure. And this is why we end up with dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and all over the, over the oceans, ocean acidification, um, even in our creeks, streams and lakes where things are eutrophying because they have too much nutrient coming off of the land. And so we have got to find a way to fix that. And so that's what this system is all about. Now this was a corral before we got the farm, but all of the manure flowed off of the side of the hill here and into the creek, which I wanted to prevent because I don't want my creeks getting the nutrient off of the land. And so there's actually a berm that's hard to see right now because of the snow that prevents that nutrient from going into the creek. And this berm feeds the water and the nutrient that comes off of here into a small pond, which I'll go show you right now. So before we go to the pond, what's going to happen here is that we're going to have cows, sheep, and goats that are coming back from the fields, bringing their manure inside of their manure tanks, and they're going to deposit there. And we're going to have mulch down on the ground, which is going to absorb some of that nutrient. Our chickens are then going to eat any bugs that hatch inside of the manure patties. And in fact, when you think about the manure that comes off the back of a cow, it's actually kind of like sauerkraut. I mean, basically a cow is a giant fermentation tank. And there's been plenty of studies that show that pigs and even dogs and, and other omnivores can actually get a lot of nutrition off of cow manure. And if you observe cows in an environment where they're mixed in with other species, they will happily go and consume and can get a very large percentage of their calories off of the manure, off of animals. Now I know for humans that's gonna sound really disgusting, but if you look at things through that lens of energy and through trophic cascades, it's a really, really important part of a regenerative cycle. And so these animals are going to, when you think about cows and sheep and goats that are going out, they're basically going and harvesting solar energy from the greater 160 acres and they're concentrating it right here in a way that allows us to put those wastes to productive use. Now inevitably, not all the nutrient is gonna get picked up in the mulch, not all of the manure is going to get consumed by the pigs 
And so we have to come up with ways of capturing that because that is valuable nutrient. We don't want it going out to the ocean. We want to put it to productive use. So we can get another cycle out of that system if we put our thinking cap on and find a way to put that nutrient laden water to productive use. So right over here is a small little pond that will pick up all the manure from our corral system and fill in this hole. But you can't really see it right now because of the snow, which is why I wore this red jacket. So I'm gonna walk down into the hole so you can see how the pond looks with a little bit of contrast. Okay, so I'm down here and the reason the pond is quite small and it's quite shallow is that we want to make sure that the pond will actually heat up in the summertime. We want nutrient dense water that's warm so that we can facilitate the production of duckweed. And duckweed, also known as Lemna minor, is a high protein aquatic plant that can double in volume every single 24 hours. So the water in here will be filled from the snow runoff in the winter time, but we also have a solar pumping system on our farm that will pump water to a header tank that will be able to draw down to keep this topped up seasonally. Now duckweed will be able to be pumped from this pond up into the corral system where we can feed our pigs, our ducks, our chickens, our cows, um, even our geese will probably eat it. Pretty much everything will consume what comes off of here. And then we can also grow something called a fathead minnow, which is a highly prolific, tiny little minnow that's high in protein and fat, which will also supplement our uh, livestock up there. Now, a buddy of mine has found that in these systems, you tend to also get crustaceans growing. Crustaceans are basically calcium. And so when we think about the needs of our fowl, our chickens and our ducks, we typically are giving them oyster shells in order to give them enough calcium for their eggs. And it turns out that we can grow at least some of that calcium in this aquatic system right here. So this pond eventually will have a giant dome over top of it to increase the amount of solar energy going into it. That will increase the amount of energy in the water and will extend the growing season for the duckweed that we'll be able to produce for the livestock in the integrated livestock system. Now eventually, this pond will overflow once in a while, and so we need to design the overflow into the system as well. And so where you see all those piles with brown in it, that's all old tree roots and tree stumps that I can't use. And so we're gonna build the largest hookah culture in Alberta right here. We're gonna bury all of that tree waste underground and this is going to overflow into a swale, which will then feed an orchard just down below it. Now, the reason we have the integrated livestock system right next to the orchard is that we'll be able to apply selective pressure with our ducks and our chickens and maybe even our pigs once in a while uh, down into the orchard so that they can uh, get rid of things like codling moth, uh, deal with any kind of insect pests and also fertilize that orchard. <clears throat> and so you can see that the integrated livestock system, the duckweed system, and the orchard or food forest are all integrated. And when I get back to the office, I'll show you an illustration uh, that I've done that basically shows how these systems are connected so you can get a better sense of how and why they're placed in specific areas. Only once we're able to understand how energy flows on properties, how ecosystems function, how trophic cascades work, how food webs function, are we gonna be food secure. Only then will we understand how to coexist on this planet for many more generations because the way that we're currently doing it is not functioning. And, and so hopefully you can see that by being an ethical omnivore, we're able to take advantage of whatever the climate throws at us. So if we have a really great gardening season, it might be really bad for livestock. If we have a really great livestock season, it might be really bad for gardening. And then some seasons are gonna be great for both. And so we have to adapt our outputs based upon the inputs that come into the systems. And it's only then that we can actually have security of our food supply and all of the other supply chains that we depend upon that we try and build into our lives in a permaculture system. But here's the kicker. All of this takes time and we're running out of it. So if you're looking to start building these systems into your life, to start taking control of the food supply chain that your family depends upon, the energy supply chain, 
building community and connecting with others that are trying to do the same thing, then I highly recommend that you take a permaculture design course from us or from someone else. It doesn't really matter. But a permaculture design course gives you the information, the DNA, to be able to understand how your ecosystems function, how to set systems like this up so that you can capture the wastes and turn them into resource, so that you can get the ratios right between the different layers within the trophic pyramid, so that you can grow food effortlessly that just comes out of the garden and, and nourishes you. This is what permaculture is all about. It's about systems design. And so I want to leave you today with a quote from Bill Mollison. I'm going to read it off my phone because I don't have it memorized. Each such cycle is a unique event. Diet, choice, selection, season, weather, digestion, decomposition, and regeneration differ each time it happens. Thus, it is the number of such cycles, great and small, that decide the potential for diversity. We should feel ourselves privileged to be part of such eternal renewal. Just by living, we have achieved immortality, as grass, grasshopper, gulls, geese, and other people. We are all of the diversity we experience in every real sense. If, as physical scientists assure us, we all contain a few molecules of Einstein, and if the atomic particles of our physical body reach to the outermost bounds of the universe, then we are all de facto components of all things. There is nowhere left for us to go if we are already everywhere. And this is, in truth, all we will ever have or need. If we love ourselves at all, we should respect all things equally and not claim any superiority over what are, in effect, our other parts. Is the hand superior to the eye? The bishop to the goose? The son to the mother? Bill Mollison. And so what he's getting at is that everything in nature is important. We can't turn all of these trees and forests and grasslands into carrot fields so that we can live vegetarian lives. We have to understand the cycles in nature and how different trophic layers interact with each other. And they don't just go in one direction. We have energy going up and we have energy coming back down. All of it, all of life is trying to maximize the amount of energy that it has the ability to capture. And so in essence, a permaculture farm is a highly managed solar panel where we've got humans trying to understand how each of these different flows are moving, <coughs> except that when we see waste, we rejoice because we see it as another opportunity for a cycle or a niche or an energy flow that can support us, our livestock, or the ecosystems around us. And that's what permaculture is all about. All right, so I'm back in the office now and I wanted to give you guys a quick tour of the integrated livestock system that we're building. So if you remember the red barn in the video, that's it right there. And so there'll be a fencing system that goes uh, all the way around that area. And the shape of that fencing system is gonna look somewhat like this when we're looking at it from above. So just so that you guys are oriented, um, this is south here. And this is the red barn, like I said, this is the side view or cross section. And this is the plan view. So as though we're looking at it from space. So within this corral system, we will have pigs, goats, dairy cows, and chickens, probably some ducks, probably some geese. The swale that I mentioned that picks up all the effluent that comes off of the corral system was in the back here. And so all the liquid will flow down from the corral into this swale right here, which then flows into this pond that I walked down in right here. Now behind the red barn, we're going to have a compost area. So all the compost from this corral will get moved out and into this stockpile right here. This is where the compost will age over the course of a year before it's moved to the gardens, food forests, and orchards around the property. Any effluent that comes off of this compost will also flow down into this pond down here. Now the pond will have a dock that goes out into the middle. It will also have a skimmer pump. So we're gonna skim the duckweed off of the surface from this pond, and it'll come through this pipe right up here, up towards the corrals, into a feed bin, which will have a false bottom in it so that the water can drain away and the animals can eat the duckweed. 
any accumulated water here will end up uh, falling on the corral. We may end up utilizing this water for a waddle for the pigs. So if we're going to pump the water up there, we might as well get multiple uses out of it. Haven't quite figured that part out yet. The pond will have a cylindrical structure, kind of like a Quonset tarp over top of it. This is how we're going to heat the water up, which is how we're going to increase the duckweed production. There'll be a solar panel that runs the pump, and here's the pump line in the cross-sectional view. And then when the pond overflows, if there's ever too much water, it will overflow into a swale down here. The swale will then subsurface irrigate the orchard, which is below it, which is that hookah culture area that I was mentioning. So here's the orchard from above. Here's the orchard from the side. And so now we've got an integrated livestock system. So we're putting the manure to productive use. This is really discussing, this is really showing how we're moving material up and down the trophic pyramid, showing it more as a web because the manure is not just a waste product, we're putting it to productive use to grow fish and to grow duckweed, as well as the reeds. And that is cycling back into the system. Any nutrient that's left over gets put to productive use in the orchard. And then the orchard is gonna produce food, which the chickens, pigs, ducks can get access to. There's gonna be insects in here, there's gonna be fallen fruit, um, all of which we can use the livestock to help us manage that. And so the system moves both up and down, allowing us to capture every nutrient or energy source that we possibly can. And I suspect that as we build it, it'll get better over time because we'll find new ways to optimize what we've got here. Hopefully that made sense, folks. Stay tuned to the channel as we develop this and show you step-by-step step how it all comes together and how it operates. 